We're living through an incredible age of technology and invention. But we're not the first generation of people to believe that. Go back in time 100 years and you'd find people just as amazed by the automobile as we are by the latest wireless communications technology. Go back even further in time and you'll find stunning inventions that still amaze us today. We're celebrating those ancient inventions in this video full of their greatest creations. If you own a car, you also own an odometer. That's the name given to any tool that measures the distance traveled by a vehicle or device in real time. The odometer and the car weren't invented at the same time, though. In fact, that useful piece of kit in your car was actually invented over 2,000 years ago by Vitruvius in ancient Rome. The device shouldn't be confused with a speedometer, which measures pure speed, or a tachometer, which measures the speed at which your engine is rotating. Vitruvius was a noted engineer and architect with a fantastic mind for mechanics. His first odometer was a carefully measured wheel erected on a small frame similar to the construction of a wheelbarrow. As the wheel rotated, it dropped a pebble into a bucket after each full rotation. As Vitruvius knew the exact dimensions of the wheel, he could work out how far his odometer had traveled by counting the number of pebbles in the bucket. A similar device was invented by Zhang Heng in China during the first century, who had no knowledge of Vitruvius. But that doesn't change the fact that Vitruvius had beaten him to the punch. These statues and sculptures of ancient Egypt are among the most impressive and detailed in the world. But most of them are lacking an important detail that they used to have when they were made. Amazingly, many of the great Egyptian statues of the ancient past had eyes made from crystal rock, including rhinestone lenses that made them appear ultra-realistic. The eyes are so detailed that they imitate the capillary structure of the retina and can change color depending on where they're seen from. To put that another way, they have the appearance of being alive. The difficulties that would have come with shaping and processing these crystal rock lenses thousands of years ago shouldn't be understated. Today, we'd use complicated grinding and polishing machines to achieve the effect. We have no idea what craftspeople were doing back then, but such detail and accuracy ought to have been impossible to achieve for someone working with mere hand tools. One of the best examples of this ancient and lost craft can be found in the eyes of the wooden statue of Korah in the National Museum of Cairo. There are so many amazing archaeological sites in Peru that some of them get overlooked, and sadly, Kenko is one of them. That's a shame, because the site appears to contain evidence of ancient stone softening techniques that are beyond anything we're aware of today. The rocks have the appearance of being molded and shaped by human hands, which has given them the nickname Plasticine Rocks. In many cases, the stones have one smooth and polished side and another side of clean plumb lines that look a lot like finger depressions. Things get even stranger when you turn your attention to the monoliths at Kenko, which have the appearance of huge chairs and were made for reasons unknown. Like the plasticine rocks, these stone chairs are free-flowing in their form and appear as if they were shaped out of clay rather than being carved using cutting or chipping tools. Did our ancient ancestors have a way of temporarily softening rocks? If they did, why have we never been able to rediscover it with all of our modern knowledge? The question of how the pyramids were built is one of the oldest technological queries in the world. And we can't answer it, nor can anybody else. Anyone who claims otherwise is a liar. It seems highly likely that an unknown or forgotten type of technology was used in the construction of Egypt's famous pyramids. But perhaps we can offer you an alternative idea. Carrying those enormous blocks of stone across dry sand on sleds to the site of the construction work would have been almost impossible. But it wouldn't have been quite so difficult if the sand was wet. That's because water can get in between grains of sand and form a so-called liquid bridge, easing the passage of anything that moves over the top of it. For a while, the water will also act as a glue, holding the grains in place and preventing a sled from sinking into the sand. Ancient Egypt was rarely short of water, 
and Nefaro probably wouldn't have had any hesitation about signing off on the use of masses of water reserves for this purpose. Are we saying that this is definitely how it was done? No, that would be foolish. But it deserves consideration as a method. Staying with the theme of ancient Egypt for a moment, we find the Temple of Khafre in the Giza Plateau, not far from the Sphinx. The ancient temple went totally unnoticed until 1852 because it was buried under layers of sand, which served as a preservative. It's one of the planet's most striking examples of polygonal masonry, and we can only guess at how the Egyptians put it all together. The blocks that make up the walls of the temple weigh between 100 and 150 tons each, but are fit together with surgical precision without any mortar or other bonding agent. The blocks were cut and placed together with the snugness of a jigsaw puzzle. Just moving blocks this big above head height wouldn't have been easy for the engineers working on the project, but cutting and fitting them together so well that no gaps exist anywhere is nothing short of miraculous. In some corners, the blocks even appear to bend. These days, we'd use 3D modeling techniques to design the appropriate block shapes. Back then, they were working with their eyes alone and arguably doing a better job. On the hottest days of summer, you're very glad that you have air conditioning in your home, and you wonder what people did before air conditioning was invented? The answer to that question, especially in ancient Egypt and Persia, was that people used badgers or malkovs. A few examples of these ancient wind-catching cooling constructions still exist today, and there are a few scientists who claim they're more efficient than any modern air conditioner. The first bad years were invented about 2,000 years ago, taking the form of enormous chimney-like towers. They're effectively perpetual motion machines, requiring no power source to operate, and capable of continuing to work for all eternity without repairs so long as they're not destroyed by external forces. Openings at the top of the structure suck down fresh air and circulate it throughout whole buildings pushing out stale air and cooling the walls of the building as the air moves. If the badger is large enough, it can even be used to cool water supplies held beneath the buildings. We might think modern air conditioner units are more convenient, but the ancient Persians got all the same benefits without having to pay power bills. We've asked one of the world's biggest historical technology questions about the construction of the pyramids. Now here's another one. Did the Philosopher's Stone ever exist, and is such a device even possible? For those who've never heard of the Philosopher's Stone outside of the confines of a Harry Potter novel, it's basically a way of turning any metal into gold. It doesn't have to be a stone, any method will do. In folklore and legends, it's a red gem made from dragon's blood that turns metal into gold upon contact. But could there be any science behind the myth? Generations of alchemists certainly thought so, and in the process of trying to find it, they made many wonderful contributions to the fields of medicine and chemistry. It turns out that the process is scientifically possible thanks to a process called nuclear transmutation, where protons are added to or removed from the nucleus of an atom to change the form of that atom. This is how uranium used in nuclear energy becomes barium and also how carbon becomes nitrogen. Hydrogen can also become helium, and helium can become lithium. It's entirely possible to turn lead into gold, but the bad news is that would be so expensive to do it in a lab that it'd be more cost-effective to mine the gold the traditional way. In the Bredensky district of the Chelyabinsk region of Russia, you'll find a 7,000-year-old fortified settlement called Arkheim. Noted for its fine ancient ceramics and bronze work, more important than the art, however, is the technology that was used to create it. We're talking about the Archime Furnaces. Melting bronze 7,000 years ago wasn't an easy task. It required extremely high controlled temperatures, and Archaim Furnaces were a great way of producing them. Each furnace was built next to a well through which water could be drawn and then cooled by air entering the furnace's central column. An air-blowing channel in the ground fed the flames and allowed the furnace to reach a temperature of 1,500 degrees or above. That's not only hot enough to melt bronze, 
It's also hot enough to smelt copper from ore. The furnaces are sometimes called miracle furnaces because they're designed in such a way that cool air rises and hot air falls. While the effect can be observed by firing up one of the furnaces, it cannot be adequately explained even with the benefits of modern science. The Pozo de San Patrizio in Umbria, central Italy, looks like a vast cathedral. It's actually a well, but it's almost demeaning to refer to it in such humble terms. The enormous well, built over 10 years between 1527 and 1537, is an engineering marvel. Pope Clement VII personally ordered the construction of the well while hiding out in Oviedo after the sacking of Rome. The colossal hole in the ground is 170 feet deep and features a double helix design, allowing donkeys to carry and drop off water up and down without running into each other or creating obstructions on the way. The Pope was fearful of a water shortage should the city fall under siege as Rome did and considered the one well that already existed there to be insufficient. At the time it was designed and built by Antonio de Sangallo the Younger, there was no well construction like it anywhere in Europe. A series of windows prevent the interior of the well from becoming gloomy, and a bridge across the bottom allows people to scoop up water without getting too wet in the process. The Pope was long gone by the time the well was finished, and there never was a siege in Umbria. But that takes nothing away from the magnificence of the construction. Around 2,800 years ago, the ancient Chinese created an artificial pigment called Han Purple. They used it on wall paintings, ceramics, jewelry, metal, and as a decorative paint on their famous terracotta warriors. In short, they used it everywhere they could because they were very proud of it. We understand why. The process of creating Han Purple was so complex that it wasn't until 1992 that modern era scientists were able to determine its composition and recreate it. Prior to then, it had been absent from the world for 1800 years. The synthetic compound that makes up the color is barium copper silicate and could only have been created by heating barium up to more than 100 degrees before mixing it with sand and copper in precise measurements. What makes Han Purple even more unique is that when it's exposed to LED lights, it emits powerful rays of infrared light. Quantum physicists tell us that if you expose it to extreme cold and apply huge magnetic forces, the chemical structure of the compound changes and flattens, going from three dimensions to two. It's one of the most complex compounds known to humankind, and the fact that people were making it in huge quantities 2,800 years ago is mind-blowing. In September 2020, archaeologists from England and Cyprus teamed up to examine a steel discovery made in the city of Chahak in southern Iran. There, in this 11th century dig site, researchers had found proof that chromite had been intentionally added to crucible furnaces during the steelmaking process, resulting in the world's earliest example of chromium crucible steel. The existence of crucible steel in both Central and Southern Asia prior to the Industrial Revolution in Europe has been claimed many times, but this is the first solid evidence of the reality of those claims. It would be 900 years before this formula was improved upon with the creation of chromium alloyed stainless steel in the 20th century. Several ancient manuscripts describe the city of Chahak as the center of steel production, so now we know why the steel that came from there was in such high demand. Unfortunately, it seems that production standards dropped over the years. By the 13th century, Chahak was still written of as a place where steel was made with beautiful and elaborate decorative patterns, but Chahak swords were described as brittle weapons that broke easily in battle. We wonder what went wrong. When the Rosicrucian Museum in California acquired a sealed coffin from ancient Egypt in 1971, they were happy with their purchase. They knew they were getting a well-preserved mummy in a decorative sarcophagus, and they knew it would make for a great exhibit. What they didn't know until they opened the coffin was that they'd also inherited a medical mystery. In the left knee of the male occupant of the coffin, a high-status priest known as Usurmantu, they found a 9-inch long orthopedic metal pen that had been inserted with such biomechanical precision that it was indistinguishable from what would have been a cutting-edge modern surgical procedure. 
We've always known that ancient Egyptian medicine was advanced, but this discovery showed us just how advanced these 2,600-year-old surgeons were. Experts initially believed that the pin had been inserted at a later date to reattach the mummy's leg to its body, but the sealed nature of the coffin made this impossible. Further research has confirmed that the pin had been inserted while Uzermantu was still alive. Our entire understanding of ancient medicine had to be changed considerably after this stunning discovery. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.